Well, good morning. Happy New Year to everyone out there. Uh, as, as Sherry and I were driving back to Decatur from Georgia this last week, I, I, I had this thought, and I'm sure you, a lot of you guys have had the same thought that I have, that I'm sure glad that 2020 is over. I'm sure glad that 2021 is now here. It's, a lot of us have been, been through some struggles on 2020, but, uh, and, our, and our minds tend to think about all the negative things that have happened to us, but we have a God that is working. We have a God that has done some marvelous, wonderful things through Riverside, uh, through this church family, and also just personally for me and Sherry, we, we, have, seen God, we have seen God do some amazing things in our lives. So uh, it's, it's hard for us sometimes to focus on the great things that, that the Lord has done, and it's easier for us to focus on all the negatives that have happened to us. But um, I want to challenge you guys to really consider the, some of the great things that the Lord has done. Um, and so for the, the first song that we're going to sing is just called Great Things, and it's just a celebration of all the things that God, that God has done in our lives. And so as we sing the song, I want to encourage you guys just to think about some of the great things that God did uh, in 2020 um, and just praise him for that. Celebrate the goodness of God and the grace that we've been given through Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and stand and we're going to sing the song Great Things. our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Oh, see what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great.
here looking at the temperature throughout the day and just hoping that it's going to stay cold and that it will that snow will stay on those trees as long as possible at least till I can go and take a stroll through the woods that's what I love to do when it's like this so beautiful just a couple of uh, announcements for you we have a men's breakfast Saturday this Saturday this coming Saturday January 9th at 8 a.m. so that'll be of course in the gym around back and um, you can um, let me know if you're coming uh, to that by texting me, letting me know if you're coming. And I'm also going to probably text many of you. If I don't hear from you, I'll text you and just ask you if you're coming. That, that'll help me get an idea of how many men are going to be there so that I know how much food to make. Um, and if anybody wants to help with making food, let me know. But we're going to have a good time and we're going through the study of what it is to be um, a man of God and looking to the scriptures for that. And it's just a really, really good study. Um, so I, I really hope you can come to that. I, I learned a lot from the first one that we had. So also annual church business meeting is January 20th. So seven o'clock, uh, just to let you know. And the annual reports, those of you who, who do that are, are due as soon as possible. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do... Uh, declare that you have done great things. And Lord, it is so important for us to, um, to thank you and, and to praise you in the midst of tough times, in the midst of uh, even just this last year, where there's many, many things for us to be frustrated about. And we have all been frustrated this last year. But Lord, we also are blessed to call you our Heavenly Father. And we are blessed that we we, we stand upon your promises. We stand upon your word. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we worship you, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith. And Lord, that we would please you by that faith. Lord, that we would live for your glory and your glory alone. In your name, amen. Mm -hmm. Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been or where I'm going Even when I didn't know it Or couldn't see it There was Jesus For this man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been or where I'm going Even when I didn't know it Or couldn't see it There was Jesus On the mountain, in the valleys There was Jesus In the shadows of the alleys There was Jesus In the fire, in the flood Always is and always was. No, I never walked alone. You were always there. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing. 
blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. As we continue to worship, let's go ahead and stand and sing the song by faith.
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises ruled in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of light has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man, in His trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the Christ the Lord upon the tree, in the stead of ruined sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could ever restrain him, praise the Lord. by death the God of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the Lord he is alive Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I 
Church, turn with me to Romans 4, and uh, you're watching with us online, I um, want to encourage you to make sure the dog's away and all those distractions as we get into the Word here. I know uh, when, when we had to go virtual there for, I don't know, maybe it was a month, it was, uh, it was a little difficult at times to not be distracted by the things at home, and I want to encourage you to, to dig in with us this morning as we, as we uh, dig deep into this, this beautiful passage about faith. And uh, so let's pray before we get into it. Father, we just uh, thank you that, that what we just sang rings true in, in our hearts as you have um, bought us with your precious blood. You have, um, you have given us your righteousness. And Lord, you have... Um, made us new. And Lord, you're continuing through the sanctification um, process to make us more like yourself. And Lord, we pray that you would do that this morning. Uh, wash our hearts, our minds with your word and pierce um, down to the depths of, of who we are. It's only you that can do that for you know us even more than we know ourselves. In your name, amen. Romans chapter 4 we're going to focus on specifically verse 13 this morning, but I want to read through this whole section and kind of give a feel for what's going on in this whole section, and we're going to be in this for the next uh, about month and a half. Uh, but we're going to focus specifically on verse 13 this morning. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For, it is, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. 
in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So I want to give you an overview here uh, of this text and and what we're going to be focusing on the next uh, probably five sermons here. Uh, We're going to, next Sunday, focus on the law and the specifics of the law and what he's talking about here. I have some questions about, especially verse verse 15 in regards to uh, it bringing wrath, what the function of the law is. Why does it say where there is no law, there is no transgression? Those are some questions I have for the text. And then when we go from that, out of verse 15, we'll get into verse 16 through 17, which is God's promises that unite Jews and Gentiles into one people for God. And I think I'm excited to preach on that because I think of how disunified our, our, our country is even on, on race and, and ethnicity and culture. And, and yet we don't see that in Scripture. We see God wanting to unite all of that. Uh, So we're going to focus on that in verse 16 and 17. And then 18 through 22 is Abraham's faith was firm and persevering, persevering kind of faith. And then 23 through 25, which is a foundation of Christian faith. That's like the foundation for the Christian faith. This morning, it's all about God's promises based on faith. Notice in verse 13 how Paul explains to the church then and now that the promise to Abraham and his offspring was that he would be the heir of the world. Did you catch that? The heir of the world. That Abraham would have the entire world and his offspring. And when I looked up that word offspring, I had to, I had to ask myself, okay, is that plural or singular? Uh, because in the Old Testament, when there's a promise made to Abraham that through, the, the, through your offspring, the world, the entire world will be blessed, he uses the word singular for offspring. Jesus, specifically, through your one offspring, the whole world will be blessed. And here in, in verse 13, he uses the word plural for offspring. In fact, the NASB translates it as descendants, plural. So, Abraham and you and I, his offspring, descendants of Abraham, Father Abraham, all of us have been grafted in, Gentiles grafted into God's family through faith. Because of faith, we are also offspring of Abraham's original faith that was credited to him as righteousness. Now we have that righteousness credited to us, and we are sons of of the king of kings, and it all came down, passed down through Abraham. That's what he's getting to here. So we are all heirs of the world. What? What does that mean? I I really wanted to dig deeper into that. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend this morning going into a lot of different scripture passages um, because we want to use the scripture to understand what Paul is getting at here both Old and New Testament. So the first one that comes to my mind is Revelations 20, verse 4. Revelations 20, verse 4. It says this. This is talking about the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth with his people. In verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast 
or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Reigning with Christ for a thousand years, even judging the world during that time. Then you can go back to uh, 2 Timothy 2.12, real quick, it just says this, if we endure, we will reign with him. He's speaking to the church and the church age. Church age. If we endure and we persevere in our faith, as Abraham did, notice that in Romans it talks about his faith persevering. In verse 20, it says that he grew strong in his faith. Abraham grew strong in his faith. It was a faith, a persevering faith, an authentic faith. And and, and 2 Timothy 2.12 says that if we endure, we will reign with him. Daniel 7 is another big one. Daniel 7, verse 27, says this. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So, God's people will rule with him and, in, and under his sovereignty in this new kingdom where all of the world will be under it, and it's a kingdom that will go on forever. That is a powerful statement. Matthew 5.5, 5, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the meek. For what? They will inherit the earth. Think about that for a little bit. Inherit the earth. Inherit the entire world. That is, a, that is a, a statement that should cause us all to stop and go, what does that look like? What is that going to look like? And there's some mystery in it. I haven't gotten it all figured out because I'm not there yet. Someday we'll get to experience that as the church. We will reign with Christ in this world. And it'll be a world that'll be different than we see today. Satan will be bound for a thousand years, it says in Revelation 20. And that, and that he won't deceive the nations anymore. I believe also that during that time, after the tribulation, those who survive the tribulation, kids of, of, of those people will be born during that time. And there will be a chance for people to even rebel, but not under satan's influence rather it will be almost like in the garden but even without satan there well everything will be perfect this word will be restored and 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 people will have a choice to pick between following god or going their own way and it's amazing to think that people would even go their own way during that time it shows that even if things are perfect people still go their own way even if things are perfect. Now, there's a lot of mystery here on this because uh, it's just a, 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 it's hard for us to imagine what that's going to be like. As I was reading on this through the prophets, um, when I studied and preached on Revelation, uh, there was one part in one of the prophets that really stuck out to me, and it, it was talking about how there will be um, justice that will be dealt with very swiftly during this time, very swiftly, and that if someone dies, it will be like, if someone dies at like 100 years old, it will be like they were accursed. So what it's saying is that if anybody dies during that time, then it'll be because they sinned. It would be because they rebelled, and there will be justice, there will be swift justice on that person that is, is rebelling against this kingdom of God that will dominate the earth. Luke 16.10 says this, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in too much. Luke 19.17 says, Well done, good servant, Jesus said, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be an authority over ten cities. Matthew 25.23, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things Enter into the joy of your master. Guys, heaven is not going to be, the millennial kingdom, the new heaven, the new earth, is not going to be us just sitting around bored. You know, singing kumbaya for thousands of years. It's going to be a time where we're going to be worshiping Christ, but we're going to be worshiping him just like we do now with our lives and how we live. 
but it's going to be a time where there won't be death anymore, a new heaven, a new earth. And this reigning that we will have with Christ will be a time where everything that we long for in this earth will start to come to fruition in that time period. For example, I don't know about you, but I get tired of corrupt politics. Do you? I get tired of this stuff. I get tired of not knowing who I can trust. You know, this time, Christ will reign on this earth and we can trust him fully. And and there won't be any injustice. There won't be any wars going on during that time. It will be a time of perfect peace where saints will reign with him and we will get to be a part of what he is doing on this earth tangibly and we'll see it every day. We see it now, but this is just a taste of what it's going to be like. Man, that's going to be awesome. I think of missionaries like Amy Carmichael who served in India. Who, who left her family and served in India for 55 years without furlough. Can you imagine that? 55 years without fur, furlough, starting an orphanage for little kids, loving on kids, pouring out her life for others. And she was faithful in very little. She had a powerful government over and authority over her in India. But you know what? Someday she's going to be ruling with Christ. Wow. These people who who gave of themselves, who were faithful with the little things that God gave them, will be given much more in his kingdom. I think of Gladys Aylward. I read uh, about her, her um, bibliography to my kids. And man, it was a powerful story. And these are the kinds of people that our kids need to see as their heroes. Forget sports athletes. I mean, I watched the Buckeyes. It was an awesome game. I love watching sports. But I don't want my kids looking up to... Fields from Ohio State or LeBron James or any of these guys. I want them looking up to these guys that we hear about that have given up of their lives for Christ. And that's who I want them to have as their hero. Gladys Aylward served in China. and She took a hundred orphan kids over the mountains after she had been injured as the Japanese army took over in World War II China. And she was escaping them because they were slaughtering people. And she took these hundred orphans over the mountains and she barely survived. You think about it, how frustrating frustrating that had to be for her. She's just trying to take care of these kids. And because of war, And because of Satan's deception over nations, and Japan was deceived in in ways that I can't even describe to you how bad they were deceived. That their emperor was like a god, and Satan was using that. And and now here's this missionary in China that's reaching people for for Jesus, and she's loving on kids, and she did so many amazing things over there. I could go on and on about um, how she she was trying to teach the, the foot binding that they did for women at the time. And if you study into that, what they did in China, it is crazy. It crippled women. And I don't know what perversion caused men to do that to women, but that's what was happening. And she, she, she was freeing the culture from that. She was doing so many amazing things in the name of Christ. And then this the Japanese army comes in and she has to flee over mountains with a hundred orphans. And can you imagine the frustration that she would have at that point? Trying to serve Jesus. And this government is, there's war going on, and it's completely outside of my control. Well, someday, she is going to be able to rule with Christ in a world that's much different than that. I was talking to my brother-in-law about the mega rich, you know, in the world. And Amazon, uh, founder of Amazon, do you know how much that guy's worth? He's way surpassed Bill Gates. $291 billion this guy's worth. I mean, I like Amazon. It's great. We have like super powerful, rich people in this world. And and, and you know what? I I like it that people can, can, can become rich. But you know what, you guys? I look at that and I go, if I were to look at this world from this is all I've got and there's nothing after this and there's just, it's just secular, it's just material, there's no soul, there's nothing else, then really it's kind of depressing to think that all I've got is just this little bit. What about people that live in third world countries that I talked about last week, like that Haitian guy who was praising Jesus and singing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. What about those people? Church, someday I think that those people will have more than some of these people, way more than some of these people in this life. 
It's amazing to think about that, the rewards that heaven is going to bring, the rewards that, that, that we are going to have as followers of Christ, and that we, our inheritance is the world. That's amazing that God is going to give that to us. People that had hardly anything in this life, I think of countless people. I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who died because he wouldn't give up his friends to the Nazis and, and he spoke against Hitler and he was killed. I think of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott who gave their lives for the gospel in Ecuador and countless others because of their love for their Lord and their love for people. In church, they are going to inherit the world. That is their reward. But over than that, the reward is God himself and the relationship with Jesus reigning with him. Reigning with him. Wow, that is powerful truth to dwell on. But how does this get unlocked? How do we get this? Well, it's clear here. Through what? Through the righteousness of faith. Through faith. Faith is what unlocks These promises of God and our inheritance. Faith unlocks that. So I'd like to spend some time just giving a brief theology of faith. And I I like to use that that, um, Jewish uh, mindset of a string of of pearls, or or, sorry, a, a string of pearls, where you string together a bunch of passages to make this theology. And and so um, the best one to go to first is Hebrews. Chapter 11, verse 1, right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You can turn with me there if you'd like. This is, a, this is the faith chapter of the Bible. If you're wanting to know what faith is, you turn to Hebrews, Hebrews 11. It starts out with this statement, and then it gives all these examples of people who, who lived this way. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, I just want to unpack that a little bit here. My question is those two words, assurance and conviction. What do those words mean? I want to know what those words mean because he's saying specifically they are assurance. Faith is this. It's the assurance of things hoped for. Conviction of things not seen. This key word, assurance, in the Greek is hypostasis hypostasis, and it means confidence, confidence. The root word for that word is histemi, and it means to stand, to stand on something, to be immovable. Um, William Arndt wrote about uh, this word in the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, and I really like how he described this word and the word conviction. He says that in classical Greek, the Greek person would have understood this word to mean just reality in contrast of what merely seems to be. Get that? This is reality. Faith that he's talking about here is a faith that believes that God is reality, that Jesus died for my sins and that's a reality, and that God is going to restore all of these things someday when he returns again, and that is a reality, and that's what the scriptures say. I don't care what your views are on the end times, all of us agree that Jesus is going to return someday, right? And eventually this is all going to be restored. The timing of that, everybody looks at it differently, but we all believe that God is going to restore this world, and church... Don't you want that kind of faith? The faith that really believes that this is a reality? It contrasts with what merely seems to be. What do we, what do things seem to be sometimes for us? When your dad has cancer, when things are rough in this world, Satan wants to use those rough times and shake your faith to make you think that it's all just brokenness and life is just chance and we all are going to get some disease it's out of our control someday and pass away and you gaze into that and it erodes away at your faith but for us as believers we gaze into that and we see what God has in store and we see his word which teaches us that these things are going to come now if God were to say you follow me 
and everything's going to be good, and you're not going to have cancer, and you're going to have just a, a, a wonderful, prosperous life, and you're going to get rich like the guy, maybe kind of like the guy from Amazon, or whatever. Then we would have question to go, well, maybe this is all a bunch of baloney. But we don't see that, do we? So we choose to base our faith on reality, the realities of what God's Word says to us. This word conviction is elonkos, and it means proof or rebuke. Rebuke and proving, almost like in a court of law. The classical Greek definition is this. There's two definitions, actually. One is the act of presenting evidence for the truth. Presenting evidence for the truth. We, church, as believers, are supposed to be presenting evidence for the truth with our words and with our lives, with how we live. And we are so convicted by this truth that we want to present it and the evidence that we have for it that this is a reality. The other definition is this, the act of charging a person with wrongdoing. I tend to look at it that way, this way. Charging, proving, evidence for. I'm so convicted about this that when I look at something that seems to question it, seems to push against it, a satanic lie from hell, like cancer is bad, and so therefore life is just rough, and God may not be good after all. I preach truth, and I convict that 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 belief that it's wrong. I charge against that belief with the reality that comes from God's Word. That's what he's saying here. This is a conviction deep in your soul that this is true and that nothing can shake this. 2 Timothy 4.7 says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have what? I have kept the faith. Faith is persevering, church. Faith perseveres. True, authentic faith perseveres. James says that even the demons believe and shudder, right? So what I want is I want true, authentic faith, not just words, not just I believe in God. I want what is true, authentic faith, and that's what we see being described here in Hebrews chapter 11. Church, faith is a big deal. It's a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because of a couple facts that the Scriptures say about faith. We inherit the world through faith, as I just said, as we just were seen, were shown here in Romans. We inherit the entire world through faith. That's how we get it. We are saved through faith. By grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2, 8, through what? Faith. Faith is a big deal. We are saved through it. Your faith in Jesus will move the mountain of sin that separates you from God. That's how powerful faith is. It removes the mountain. God uses it. It's what the vehicle by which God gives us His grace and His mercy. God acts on our behalf through faith. And there are countless stories in Scripture where we see this. Hebrews 11, 11. We're in Hebrews 11. 11, 11, it says, by faith, Sarah received power to conceive. And that goes along with this Romans text. By faith, how did she have children? How did she have children? By faith. That's how she had children. Through her faith, God gave her this gift, this miraculous gift of a child in her old age. God acts through faith on our behalf. Hebrews eleven six 6 says this, you can... It says that you can only please God through faith. Without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God. So, if you want to please God, you got to have faith. So if faith is such a big deal, I want to ask this question then. How do we grow it? What if you feel like your faith is small? What if you have a hard time looking at those frustrations in life? Why this and why that? And it's, it's difficult to see what God is doing. Church, I often look at missionary stories and how much they gave up for Christ, and I feel like my faith is this big. Do you feel that way sometimes? I hear about these people who give up their lives 
for the gospel and leave their family, never to see them again, especially back in the day when they didn't have airplanes. They would just go on a boat and they would go to China to save people with the gospel. And they would leave their family. And I go, I, I hope that I would have enough faith that if God called me to do it, that I would do it. How do I grow this faith? How do I get to that point where I'm ready to say, Lord, whatever you have for me, I will do it. I think the scriptures are full of truth for us that want that kind of faith. Luke 17, 5, the apostles asked this of Jesus. They said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Church, we should all be wanting that. We should all be asking God to increase our faith. I want more faith, Jesus, because that's how I'm going to please you. That's how I'm going to be obedient to you, is through faith. How do we do this? We should want to do it. You think about it, church. When something is extremely valuable to you, you work to protect it. Don't you? Look at all what faith does to us. I hope that faith is valuable to you. You've got to work to protect it. I went on this pond tour a while back, and I went to this pond in, in Chicago, and this guy had a, over a million dollars invested in this pond. And you're like, who does that? A guy who has $30,000 fish. And I don't know why fish are worth that much. It's crazy, right? But he has these fish. They're like these huge koi fish. They're like this big, and, and the water is just perfect. And the environment for this fish is perfect, so they can just keep getting bigger and bigger. And every, every bit that they get bigger, the more they're worth, you know. And so people come. It was just crowded with people seeing these fish and seeing this pond. You know, why does he do that? Why does he spend millions of dollars on all the filtration and, and, and all that goes into maintaining this this amazing pond, because he has these fish that he wants to protect and he wants them to, to flourish. And church, that is how it is with anything in life. You know, Heidi, she has this ring. She has this uh, engagement ring that I got her. And it's a nice ring. I, you know, back, I wish Brianna was here so she could tease me. Um, you know, she loves it when I mention the steel factory because she's heard the story so many times. But I worked at the steel factory, made good money. So I got Heidi a really good engagement ring. Problem is, it now is too loose on her finger. And so, and so it just slides off really easily. So she got this fake like cubic zirconium ring so she could have an engagement ring on and has put that one in the, ju in the jewelry box until she can get it, uh, until she can get it sized because she's so afraid that she's going to lose this ring, you know. She's protecting it. So how do we protect our faith and, and help our faith grow? How do we strengthen it so that it flourishes? Well, the scripture gives us Many words on this. Romans 10, 17 says this, faith comes from hearing the word of Christ. How do we strengthen it? In church, if your faith is small, you got to first ask yourself this, are you devoted to the word? Are you devoted to the word? Do you want more of the word? Because the word is what strengthens your faith. The more that I know this Bible, the more that I'm amazed that over thousands of years God put this together and it is all one unfolding story and I see how it connects and I, and I, hear, I feel its conviction for my heart and, and it pierces it to, to divide the intentions of my heart so that I want to be more like my Savior and I am amazed by the word of God because it is who God is. Jesus is the Word, so the Word in flesh. You guys, I am amazed by the Word of God. And the more that I read of it, the more that I dig deep into it, the more my faith is increased. And God tells us that in His Word. Also, so first, how do you grow it? Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Second, walk by faith. Step by step, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We just sang about that. We walk by faith and not by sight. Anyone that I know who has very strong faith, it's like they intentionally look at every step in life as what is God doing now? What does he want me to do? Every little step is a step with Jesus, is a walk with their Lord. So let's do that. Let's ask God to open up our eyes so that we can see his wondrous works in our life. And we'll thank him a lot more too, church, if we do that. 
We'll be more filled with his joy. We will rejoice more in the Lord. We will have a much happier life if we could just open up our eyes and see what he's doing and take every step in life with our Savior. Walk step by step. Walk out your faith. It's not just something on Sunday morning. That's a big part of it. But it's throughout the week asking God to show us what he would have for us. Next, be called according to his purposes. Be called, church, according to his purposes. Be obedient. When you're obedient, God shows you how good he is. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. What? For those who are called according to his purposes. So are you called according to his purposes? Here, let me give you an example. When I was in uh, the park, Central Park, uh, feeding with some of you guys about two weeks ago. When I was there, we heard shots in the distance at the plasma center. You know, it was pop, pop, pop. And I'm like, man, that sounds like gunshots, you know. And then next thing we know, we find out in the news that there was a shooting at the plasma center right when we were there. So it was gunshots. Now, am I going to be like, okay, we're not going to serve at the park anymore. It's just, it's just too dangerous. No way. No way. We've been back every Saturday since then. Because why? Because I know that I want the center of God's will. It's the most safest place for my life. God is going to protect me, and his will is going to be accomplished in my life. And really, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. And I can't think of any better way to go than serving Jesus. Right? Man, I, I, I was watching... Uh, uh, John MacArthur, and, and they were trying to uh, shut down his church during, during this pandemic. And, and the governor said, if you don't shut down your church, you know, we're going to throw you in jail. And regardless of whether you agree with how he opened his church and all that, I loved what he said. He said, he said bring it on, man. He's like, I've always wanted to have a good prison ministry. His, 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 his greatest hero in Scripture is the Apostle Paul. You know, and so he's like, I'm, I'm, I believe we need to have, we need to be ministering to people during this time and, and we're going to open up our church. And if you want to throw me in jail, then fine. So be it. I like his, I like his guts, his confidence that the Lord can use him no matter where he goes. That is, that is faith, church. That's faith. That's bold, courageous faith that doesn't cow to anybody. That I want to please God first and foremost above anybody else. Karen Luther went with us on our missions trip to Haiti a couple years ago. And I know that some people were a little concerned. You know, she's in her 60s at the time. I still in her 60s. And she went on this trip. And, and church, we went out into the boonies of Haiti to minister to kids, long walks. And it was amazing that she didn't have any issues. She gets back to the States and... She breaks her foot when she's back at the States, soon after that. Then after she breaks her foot, she told me I could share this, by the way, she trips and falls, and she breaks her shoulder. She injures her shoulder, and she says this. Here's the quote. God's protection is amazing. I'm amazed that that didn't happen to me in Haiti. would have been much worse what happened in Haiti. But God was watching over her. We went to Haiti, and soon after we were there, they had riots. God got us out of Haiti. It's amazing to me. I want to show you another v a video of, of my father. And, and he, he, you know, many of you know he was in a plane crash. This is a news video, and I love what is addressed in this video. So watch this real quick. He escaped death in a fiery plane crash, returns home tonight. He was flying a plane belonging to a missionary group called Air Mobile Ministries when it crashed in the Bahamas. Anita Smith met him in Titusville as he came home to tell his story of survival. She is live there right now. Anita? Well, Marla and Todd, the group of five was headed to the Bahamas to help the many Haitians who flee their homeland and arrive there with absolutely nothing. The group was minutes from landing when danger hit. It's a miracle I'm here. I just praise God for it. I'll get a couple of guys to carry me to the car here. Tim Hahn's broken bones are a small exchange for life. He could have died in this plane crash. The day after Christmas, Hahn was piloting the Cessna 401 to the Bahama Islands. Almost there, the plane's engine lost power. Just did not make the runway. Went into the trees, and we made a control landing into the trees, and um, 
that's all I remember. Because Han remembered his training, when it counted, his four passengers also survived. They're all missionaries with Air Mobile Ministries, a Titusville-based group headed up by Joe Hurston. Honestly, I'll not believe what five people walked out of. You just won't believe it. Some pieces of the plane and the pilot are home. Hurston says two of his missionaries are still there, helping people by showing their film about Jesus. I flew a plane over there today to pick them up, and they said, well, you know, why are you picking us up? <laughs> And I said, you, you just walked out of a fireball and survived a plane crash. And they said, well, we came here to show the film and, and, and to minister with the Haitians. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Tim Hahn will spend the next month or so recuperating, but says he'll be back to help soon. I feel great. I just, it's amazing. I just praise the Lord that he's not finished with me. Um, so, um... I love that video because my dad kept serving and doing missions trips for years after that into Haiti. And he's the one that always told me, you know, when you're in the center of God's will, you're in the safest place possible. Church, you want to have your faith strengthened? Be obedient to the Lord. Be obedient. I want to ask you this year, maybe this is a New Year's resolution for you. How can you be obedient to the Lord? How can you be committed to his word, to his church? Jesus said, I'll establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I, I, I know that some things are going to be changing in our church as we start to get back together. Once the, as the pandemic starts to die down and we start to see more and more people come back, we're excited, we're looking forward to that and we want to be prepared. And one thing that I know before this pandemic happened, I, I felt an angst about the fact that our church, many people didn't know each other. The early church ate together like every time they got together. This is something that I want to start doing more. I don't know how often we're going to do it, but it's going to be way more often than we used to. We're going to eat after church together. We're going to talk about the message. We need to be in each other's lives. That we love each other and we get to know each other. And, and I want to encourage you. Maybe God's called you to serve in that way in some way. Maybe God's called you to serve in outreach ministries like we do in the park. I'm so glad we do that consistently. Like my brother, Charlie, I love, man, I just love hanging out with you, bro. I mean, he just comes consistently and his smile just, just, uh, just cheers me up every time I see him. And so God's working through that. And, and, and maybe God has more for us to do in outreach. I don't know. But I want to be obedient. And I want to ask you, how can you be obedient? Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's, it's some other form of fellowship ministry in the church, men's ministry, women's ministry, children's ministry. There are needs in the church. And I want to encourage you to be praying about it and poised to ask the Lord, how can I be obedient to Jesus through this time? Next week, we're going to get into the promises of God. Um, I had that today, but I don't have enough time for that. We'll get into that next week, and I don't want to rush through it. Uh, but let's close in some prayer, okay, church? Let's close in some prayer. Father, we just thank you that... Lord, you've given us all that we need to strengthen us during this fight, this journey in this world. Lord, you have equipped us with your word and with the spirit and with your church. Help us to, um, to be obedient and use us, Lord, to impact a world that desperately needs the faith that unlocks all of the hope and the promises and the blessings that come from a relationship with you. In your name we pray, amen. First Thessalonians says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. Be blessed, church.